autism um, can be something of an emotional uh, thing to talk about because uh, many of you guys might have family members or uh, know people have very close connections to people with autism. And while I don't have any immediate family members um, with autism, I do have some extended family. Uh, but over the past 12 years, uh, 14 years now, I've um, been involved working directly with people with autism from everything through um, direct care services. Um, I was a special education teacher for a number of years. I did clinical behavior therapy for a number of years. And, and um, recently, I, uh, I took a job at UT San, uh, UT San Antonio here as an assistant professor of special education. And I'm training future special education teachers. And we also run a clinic uh, providing direct services and training behavior analysts uh, out of our uh, team autism program uh, at our downtown campus. Uh, and this uh, presentation today is uh, an overview of, of what uh, probably most behavior analysts, uh, how most behavior analysts conceptualize autism. Um, behavior analysis and autism tend to go hand in hand, and it's, it's very likely if you've uh, heard of one, you've heard of the other. Uh, and, and largely, um, the growth of behavior analysis can largely be attributed to the uh, growth of autism. Uh, and that's for a very good reason. Um, there are a lot of, of children out there that uh, you could simply throw books at and they would learn how to read. Uh, but it's the population of children with autism that, that really hold the teacher accountable and require us to use very uh, explicit and direct instructional techniques or else they're not going to learn how to read or, or learn how to do adaptive behaviors or functional skills and things like that. So what we've learned from working with these children is that there are certainly effective practices and evidence-based practices uh, that these children require of us to use uh, in order to be uh, effective teachers. And Largely, those effective practices are not unique only to the population of children with autism, but they, they do expand to other uh, disability categories and even uh, general education classrooms as well. Um, but I'd like to start with just a little brief history of autism. Uh, so in 1908, Eugene Bueller, who's a Swiss psychiatrist, uh, first used the term autistic to describe a form of schizophrenia uh, characterized by withdrawal. What he saw was these kids preferred more than anything else to be alone and on their own. Uh, and at the time, it was attributed to childhood schizophrenia. Uh, it was many years later in the 40s that um, Leo Kanner <laughs> first described early infantile autism, again, attributing it as a type of schizophrenia uh, with the children that he worked with. These were nonverbal kids uh, engaged in high rates of restrictive repetitive behaviors, uh, didn't like to socialize with anybody else. Uh, about the same time, Hans Asperger was describing his little professors who, although they exhibited many of the same characteristics of the, the population that Leo Kanner uh, was studying, these, these children um, were verbal. They did have higher functioning skills. And in fact, they could talk endlessly and in great detail about the things that were of interest to them. Uh, and so he called these, this population there the little professors because they were, they were experts in their field. Um, Interestingly, we'll, we'll find out uh, in just a few minutes, it wasn't until several years later that uh, we came to realize that this is more or less the same population. There's different ends of the spectrum, certainly, but we're really talking about uh, the same disorder here. Uh, anybody have a guess as to why that might be? Why, why the disconnect between Leo Kanner's research and Hans Asperger's research? Exactly, yeah, I heard somebody say the war. Uh, Hans Asperger uh, was Austrian, uh, but all of his research was published in German. And back in the 40s, uh, we here in the US especially were not very interested in the research coming out of Nazi Germany. Uh, and largely uh, looked past all of that, uh, that research at the time and, and uh, later on discovered that, that it, it, yes, it does have some contributions to give us. Uh, it wasn't until the 50s that the first version of the DSM came out. Um, and mental uh, uh, the um, sorry, autistic-like symptoms um, were again uh, permanently considered a, uh, a form of childhood schizophrenia. Uh, and hopefully, you already wrote down schizophrenia. Uh, to show exactly how little we knew about autism spectrum disorders at the time, uh, in the 1960s, LSD was considered a um, prescription to try and treat the disorder. Uh, other narcotics have been used, including ecstasy, and uh, most recently there's talk of, of uh, a drug called Molly being uh, used to promote that social behavior of, of young children, uh, probably older adults, in fact, at this age, if you're going to use the, the narcotics. Um, not my field of research. 
1965, uh, Temple Grandin, who was 18 years old at the time, uh, developed her uh, compression system, her squeeze machine, uh, and found that uh, this same device, which uh, she initially invented to help um, assist with uh, terminating the lives of cattle, uh, was also very beneficial to the population of children with autism. Uh, that deep pressure sensation provided somewhat of a soothing effect and it, and it helped alleviate a lot of the, the problem behaviors that we were seeing. Uh, and as we get more into the behavior analysis part of the talk, uh, we're gonna come back to that continuity of species that largely uh, human behavior is not so different than other uh, behavior of other animals, other species, although certainly human behavior is much more complex. Uh, and the second version of the DSM, again, autism fell under the category of schizophrenia. Uh, and it wasn't until the 70s when we really started to do some research that, that differentiated between schizophrenia is, is one thing and autism is perhaps something else altogether. In the mid-70s, the Developmental, uh, Developmentally Disabled Assistance and Bill of Rights Act revised the definition of developmental disabilities to include autism. So we moved it uh, a little bit away from the uh, mental disorder into a developmental disorder. The DSM-3 was the first one to establish autism as its own separate category. And in 1980, at the same time, Lorna Wing conceptualized her triad of autism, which is uh, lack of ability of communication, deficits in social skills, and restrictive and repetitive behaviors. Uh, and you don't have to necessarily write those down now, but we'll come back to those. In 1988, the movie Rain Man really brought the notion of autism to the mainstream awareness. Uh, and unfortunately, it brought a few misconceptions as well. Uh, many people, after seeing Rain Man, uh, began, to, began to think that all people with autism had these savant skills and we could count cards. Uh, and largely, that's a, a very small minority of the population. Jim Sinclair is a rather famous um, autistic blogger, and I'm gonna specifically use the word autistic there because he's noted that uh, in his work that he can't separate the autism from the person. And while it's very politically correct of us to use people first language and always say people with autism, there's a neurodiversity movement going about saying that call us autistic. We are autistic people and we can't separate one from the other. Um, the DSM-4 came about in 1994 and they added several subcategories to the autism spectrum, really uh, identifying autism as a spectrum disorder at this point. If you have any uh, background in autism, then you've likely heard of the research by Dr. Wakefield, who attributed autism to the um, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, uh, noting that the mercury that was used to combine the different vaccines triggered the response. Uh, and of course, several years later, we found out that uh, Dr. Wakefield was actually paid a, a great amount of money um, for his research, uh, and uh, previous, uh, later research has shown that not only can we not replicate that, but we can look at populations of people that have been exposed to massive amounts of radiation poisoning uh, through chemical spills and, and other things, and we find out that those people have no higher rates of, of autism uh, in their population than do, uh, than do populations that have not been exposed to that type of mercury poisoning. Throughout the 2000s and, and, and up to this, this past couple of years, we've seen that the number of autism diagnoses has increased to what we call ep epidemic levels. An epidemic simply means uh, that they're occurring faster than we would expect. Uh, over the past five years alone, we've said it's gone from one in 100 to one in, I'm sorry, one in 110 to one in 88. Uh, in a survey that came out uh, towards the end of 2012, beginning of 2013, that was produced by the CDC, uh, says that it's actually as many as one in 50 uh, individuals have autism. Uh, but due to various collection methods, we tend to lean back towards the one in 88 method for the most accurate report of, of how many people here. Uh, and just given a, a quick head count of, of who's in the room, that's, that's, that would likely mean that at least one person here uh, has an autism diagnosis. In 2010, the Lancet formally retracted Dr. Wakefield's published findings on the subsequent scientific evidence to show that, again, there is no link between the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine or any vaccine in autism. Although still certainly today, uh, we'll find that people try to separate out those, those uh, vaccinations, um, which really actually goes against uh, the um, recommendations of most pediatricians and the, the World Health Organization. 
Uh, again, so my dates were off. It was 2011, but the CDC estimated as many as one in 50 individuals have <laughs> autism. Uh, after the Newtown massacre and reports came out that um, uh, the shooter there had an autism spectrum disorder, we began to see more links between autism and aggressive behavior. Uh, although while we do see lots of aggression with some of our kids with autism, uh, what we saw in Connecticut that day was um, can likely not largely be related to uh, his autism diagnosis. Uh, but again, going back to what Jim Sinclair said, we can't necessarily separate the autism from the individual. So we have to think that something about that combinational effect might have played a very small part. Um, in 2013, the DSM-5 most recently came out, uh, and they restricted the, limit, uh, the, the umbrella categorization of autism. Um, they limited the severity, uh, or they, they included different levels of severity. They eliminated the Asperger's and the Rett syndrome. And they added the addition of the social communication or social pragmatic communication disorder. Uh, and what that is is more or less an autism diagnosis without the restrictive and repetitive behaviors. Uh, and there are reports from Korea that came out over the past few years saying that as many as one in 34 children were being diagnosed with autism. And they suspect that under the new, uh, under the new DSM-5 categorization that 75% of those that were being diagnosed as autism in Korea would now fall into this social pragmatic communication disorder because they didn't show those restrictive signs. Uh, largely, a lot of these results are, are coming about as a technology-influenced society where we really have to spend less time communicating with one another. Uh, and that's, uh, that, that social aspect of it is, is really the underlying uh, point I'd like to get to today. In 2002, Lee Grossman, who was the president of the Autism Society of America, said that after more than, at that time, 40, but now we can say, I'm sorry, at that time, 50, and now we can say 60 years of study, uh, no causes have been identified. There needs to be a geometric increase in research funding to determine the causes of autism. Uh, and again, that was 50 years of research at the time, and now we can say that that's gone up to another 62 years. Uh, and we haven't yet found the, the uh, exact cause of autism. Uh, a lot of times you'll hear that it's a combination between a genetic predisposition and uh, an environmental trigger. Uh, and while that certainly uh, provides something of an explanation, uh, that also puts autism in the same category as seasonal allergies, um, many other uh, behavioral phenotypes that, that certainly we wouldn't say this is related to autism. So it's, it's a beginning of an understanding, but it uh, certainly doesn't lead us in much of a better direction to look for treatment. So some of the theories of autism that have come about have been that it's a neurological disorder, it's a biological disorder, uh, there are gastrointestinal issues that, that account for the autism, uh, there are sensory deficits, uh, social and emotional deficits, and behavioral deficits and uh, behavioral disorders. Uh, and for as many different theories about autism that uh, we can come up with, we can provide just as many treatments for autism. And these include diets, uh, lots of times you'll see uh, restricted diets, gluten, casein-free um, treatments, things like that. Uh, now, as I, as I talk about treatments, um, I do want to bring up the fact that autism is largely a comorbid condition. Lots of children with autism also have uh, gluten casein sensitivities. They also have uh, sensitivities to medications or other uh, neurotoxins that maybe don't affect the rest of us as well. So. Yes, we can see that by eliminating the gluten and the casein from the diet, certainly can have a profound effect on some kids. It doesn't largely have an overall effect on the autistic population. Uh, naturopathy, homeopathy remedies. Uh, we see past life regressions. I've actually met with somebody who received past life regression therapy to, uh, through hypnosis to, to address the autism. Uh, we see secretin injections, uh, in which we, we um, inject it straight into the, the gut. Uh, and again, the, 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 the mass clinical trials on this have shown that there are no significant differences between the population that does receive uh, these secretin injections and those that don't. Uh, we see chelation therapies. What do they inject? I, I'm not exactly sure what the secretin is, but it's a, it's a chemical compound designed to address the, the gastro... Uh, uh, gastrointestinal um, system. I heard a few days ago on NPR that certain percentage, I think 15 or 25 percent of autism is due to um, bacteria that lives in our intestine. 
there's uh, there's there's a lot of different treatments going around. In in general, there's a new treatment um, which. Uh, I'm kind of embarrassed to say this is going to be recorded and, and accessed forever on the CDC uh, Clarity Child Guidance Center website. But they have actual um, poop transplants where you can receive a fecal transplant, and the the positive um, bacteria from a healthy amount of feces uh, can have profound effects on on somebody else's body. Uh, and uh, so, so the fact that it, it, it does address some of these issues for some people with autism. Uh, it's probably not surprising, again, due to the different, uh, the different um, comorbid conditions that can, that can exacerbate some of the autistic symptoms that we see. So to this day, you know, like schizophrenia, we can give them medication and symptoms go away. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen with autism. So, uh, so far, we don't really have any treatment, the effective treatment that cures. There's, there's a lot of drugs that we can give that suppress a lot of behavior, uh, but suppression of behavior is not necessarily a treatment of a disorder. So exactly, that's, uh, we're on the same page. <laughs> uh, facilitated communication has been another debunked therapy where somebody actually assists the child with typing out words. Uh, and despite the evidence showing that this is largely an ineffective practice, we still see some research going on in these fields and, and people recommending such treatments. Uh, and then there are the myriad of therapies, uh, occupational therapy, equestrian therapy, um, speech therapy, uh, physical therapy, and uh, behavioral therapy is, is the one that I am most closely connected to. In particular, we see autism as more than anything else, a, a deficit, a, a contingency-shaped deficit of verbal behavior. 